Jeremy Hunt, this is a very difficult thing for a prime minister to have to say. Many more people are going to lose loved ones before their time. Uh, uh, what sort of numbers are we talking about? Well, I think it is a deeply concerning moment. And uh, if you look at the modelling that the chief medical officer believes we would be lucky to have less than 5% of the population getting the virus, uh, that would suggest a mortality rate uh, four or five times the annual average for winter flu. Um, and if you look at what happens in other countries, this can often be in the most terrible circumstances. So this is very sobering. Um, but I think the encouraging news from today is that we believe that we are four weeks behind Italy. And that is, I think, thanks to heroic efforts to contact trace people who've had, had the virus or may have the virus. Um, and I think we've probably done more than any other European country to do that. The sobering news is that maybe up to 10,000 people have got the virus as we speak in this country. And that suggests that we are in a very serious emergency. Now, although they are small countries, Denmark and Ireland have both effectively moved to a stop all mass gatherings. Schooling, everything has been closed. Um, shouldn't that be the measure here? Well, many people will be surprised and concerned that we're not moving sooner. And the reason is because... Well, are you surprised? Yes, I am. And the reason is because one thing we do have now is evidence of countries that appear to have been strikingly successful in turning back the tide of the virus. Thailand, for example, the first country outside China to get the virus, only 59 reported cases. Taiwan, right next door, only 49 cases. Uh, Shanghai, which is in the same country as, as Wuhan province, uh, is only reporting three deaths. Now, there might be under-reporting, but most people recognize that the places that have succeeded are the ones that moved earliest to social distancing, that the business of trying to keep the most vulnerable people away from places where they could catch the virus. And so I think people will be concerned that we're not moving sooner to more social distancing. For example, um, banning external visits to care homes, things like that. And I think uh, that that's, for me, one of the puzzling things about this announcement. I'd like to see the modelling that really says that people are going to tire of social distancing in a, a national and international emergency of this nature. So you're candid. You, you believe, actually, we should be moving much faster and we should be taking much more drastic measures. Well, I am concerned because we've got four weeks. We're four weeks behind Italy. And what we do every single day of those four weeks is absolutely critical. I don't want to second guess uh, the advice the scientists are giving, but I would like to see what the modelling is from the behavioural scientists that says that... Uh, you know, we can go too early with some of these measures because I think most people's priority is, th is their um, elderly loved ones who are most vulnerable, you know, perhaps 8 9% mortality rates if they get the virus, and to do everything possible to make sure that they don't get the virus. But then if I put you back into your old position as Secretary of State for Health, would you be looking at the health service and saying, yes, I wish we could do this, but actually, in order to bring the health service up to a scale in which it can cope at all, we must not take these drastic measures. Well, the point of taking drastic measures is to slow the onslaught on the NHS. So 5% of the population get the virus and 5% of those people need an intensive care bed. That's over 150,000 people who will need intensive care and we only have 4,000 beds. So this phrase, flattening the curve, is incredibly important to delay the moment that it hits the NHS, to give the NHS more time to spread the demand for those intensive care beds. So that's why doing everything we can now to delay the onset of the virus and to, to flatten that peak, absolutely critical. But I do detect that you are alarmed that the pace is not fast enough, that actually we should be moving much harder uh, to, to, to clamp down on public gatherings, to. Uh, bring about a situation which, just as you said just now, that people are not allowed to go and visit care homes if they have no business there, and the rest of it. These measures should have been taken in your view. Well, the evidence from the, around the world is that countries that acted earlier on social distancing have had more 
success. Um, I understand that the government absolutely rightly must look at the, the modeling, the scientific and behavioral modeling, but I would also say that assumptions about what is acceptable are changing. I think two months ago, very few people would have said any democracy would accept the kind of lockdowns that they're having in Italy now. But according to one poll, it has 89% public support in Italy. So I think assumptions about what the public are prepared to accept and are willing to do, if it's going to uh, reduce the chances of a fatality amongst a loved one, uh, need to be constantly checked. If we look at our own situation then, is it in part a consequence of underfunding the NHS that we're in this position? I don't think so. There's a, I, I think the NHS does need more money. I fought for more money when I was health secretary. Um, I want more doctors and more nurses. But I think even uh, the most well-resourced health systems in Europe, I mean, Lombardy in northern Italy, uh, is a rich part of Europe and it has one of the, the better healthcare systems in Europe and they are massively struggling. The scale of this is so huge that I think those longer term considerations are less significant than what we do in the next few days and weeks to reduce and spread the pressure on the healthcare system. Do you personally fear for what's to come in the next few days and weeks? I think there's all to play for. Um, if we have got four weeks, which is what the assessment was today at that press conference, then um, that is time to do a huge amount of things. And if you look at that, there are countries that have managed to stop themselves getting into Italy style situations against the odds. Uh, Singapore and Hong Kong, two very interesting examples of countries which have huge amounts of contact with China, but possibly because of the experience of dealing with SARS they um, acted very, very quickly. So I think there are definitely things that can be done, and obviously that's what we all want to happen. Just about public gatherings. If we take, for example, the Liverpool match last night, some 4,000 Spanish, mainly from Madrid, deeply affected by this virus, came to Liverpool, hung about, went to the bars, all the rest of it. Surely that was a woefully wrong thing to be doing. Well, I think the question with public gatherings. I, mean, I personally uh, don't have a great concern about uh, going into public places because I don't think I'm one of the, the most vulnerable people and one of the most vulnerable groups. But if you go to one of those public gatherings and then you have contact with an elderly relative who you could pass the virus mm -hmm. onto, that could be much more serious. So I think that's what the, the calculation has to be about these public gatherings. And if we have... But then the logic from that is you should ban these public gatherings, and many countries have. Yes, and I don't think we necessarily have to do every single thing that every single other country has done, but I do think we should look at the countries that have turned the tide on the virus, because we do now have some very interesting examples. Um, you know, I think Shanghai is, is extraordinary, uh, how the, successful they appear to have been, and ask what lessons need to be learned. Public gatherings is certainly one of the things um, there's a big debate over schools. I understand the difficulties there because of the worries that NHS workers might not be able to go to work. On the other hand, you know, could schools run a skeleton service just for health workers and other key workers that got 95% of children out of schools? These are considerations. I don't think it's for me to second guess, but I think the move towards uh, social distancing for the most vulnerable groups, that seems to me to be one of the biggest priorities. So... Uh Two very short questions. Jeremy Hunt, the optimist, where will we be in four weeks? Jeremy Hunt, the pessimist, where will we be in four weeks? Well, I'm still optimistic that we can head off what's happening, those horrific <clears throat> scenes that we're seeing in Italy, um, because I think the NHS is very good at dealing with these emergencies, and I think we have four weeks, and we have a lot more knowledge than the Italian authorities had four weeks ago. And the pessimist? The pessimist says to me that it is going to be very, very challenging to find enough intensive care beds, uh, in uh, whether it's the NHS or any other system. And so we, we really need to use every hour we have over the next few weeks wisely to make those preparations. And what would your message to the NHS staff that you used to interact with and, and run? They are absolutely amazing and, you know, we know we can count on them and we know we need to do everything possible 
to spread the pressure that is coming down the track so that it doesn't all come in a very concentrated period, uh, which means that doctors have to play God and, and decide who gets to live and who gets to die. That's the, the biggest nightmare for any doctor, um, and we want to try and avoid that as much as possible. Jeremy Hunt, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you.